Dr. Rockney had come to the Islamic Research Foundation for a discussion with Dr. Zakir. It was mutually agreed between them that instead of a personal discussion between them, it would be more preferable and better to have an open public debate on a particular topic at a convenient hall, such that the public too could hear and share in the debate and be the final judge. Dr. Zakir suggested the topics, is the Bible God's word or was Jesus God? But Pastor Rockney considered these topics too common and instead suggested the topic selected for today's debate, that is, was Christ really crucified? That's how the topic for the debate and the two speakers are before all of us today. As agreed to and decided fair by the speakers, the format for the debate will be, Pastor Rockney will address you first for 45 minutes on the topic, was Christ really crucified? Then Dr. Zakir will make his presentation on the same topic for 45 minutes. Then we would have a rebuttal session in which Pastor Rockney would comment and respond for 15 minutes to what Dr. Zakir has spoken, followed by Dr. Zakir too speaking and responding for 15 minutes to what Pastor Rockney has presented. When five minutes are left to conclude the talk as well as the rebuttal, I as the coordinator would hand each speaker a five minutes left slip, an indication slip like this, in which time both the speakers are kindly requested to conclude their talk or rebuttal. Lastly, we would have the open question and answer session in which the audience may pose questions to each of the speakers alternately on the question mics we have provided, two here next to the stage and two in the ladies section. Only if time permits, we would allow questions on slips which may be passed on to me and I would read out to the speakers. I would like to now briefly introduce the speaker, Pastor Rockney, before his talk and I would likewise introduce Dr. Zakir before his talk. Pastor Ruknuddin Henry Pio, better known as Pastor Rukni, is 43 years. He is an Arab Christian missionary. He was born a Christian in Basra, Iraq and later on brought up in Kuwait. He has postgraduated with a Master's in Science from the University of Bombay. He has had varied experience in teaching, including computer education and training, teaching the Arabic language, consultancy for computerization and development of computer software, programs in Arabic. He has been in the field of conveying the message of Christianity for over a decade. He is a Bible teacher and preacher with the India Gospel Mission. He is also a renowned faith healer. May I call upon Pastor Rukni to make his presentation. Pastor Rukni. Uh, just a small comment. Uh, even though my name is Rukni, uh, it is a variation of Rukni Deen. But very rarely people call me Rukni Deen and uh, even in my official document I'm Rukni, so you call me Rukni only. Uh, the, uh, there are many things we can discuss and many things we can talk about, but practicality doesn't permit, so we settle on one topic. Because, uh, you know, uh, it goes on and on and then understanding will be lost. Hmm? So we settled on one topic. Uh, you asked me why uh, I suggested this topic. I suggested three things and uh, 
then this was selected from it. Uh, reason is because this is a very central topic in the Christian faith. And there is a very serious difference between the uh, Muslims and the Christians um, in this point. So as uh, Mr. Naik has, Dr. Naik has suggested, we're going to talk very frankly, but in a spirit of friendship and understanding. So here is just we are uh, presenting our views from our side and left for you to uh, choose what you like and uh, reject what you like. We respect each other's views and even when you say no to my views, I respect your feelings and I totally honor your saying no. So I'm just presenting the point. Now, uh, a few things I'll be picking up from the Bible, but if I go on picking from the Bible, then there's no end to it. Because there are maybe hundreds of verses related to the cross. Uh, so some things I will just say it's from the Bible, but without really telling you where is it. Maybe a few things I will read from the Bible. Uh, because my purpose is here not that you re memorize which part and all that. Just my purpose is that you understand the message behind it. The spirit behind the uh, message of the cross. Uh, why is the cross central in the Christian faith? What is the reason the cross is so important? First of all, let me comment on the cross itself, physically the cross. Uh, what you understand, many people understand, I'm not saying all, many people understand, the cross is the following. I go to Zaveri Bazaar, search for a not very expensive jeweler, and have a nice shining little bit gold cross and hang it around my neck, and that is very suitable to fashion. Uh, some will buy a gold 17, some 18, some gold uh, 21. Good, nice, attractive looking cross going with fashion, matching my dress colors and all, etc. That is what many people understand of the cross. Even many Christians, that is the end of the understanding of the cross. And that was my understanding many years ago. I am born and brought up in a traditional Christian faith. I am a believer Christian only 16 years ago. I came to India not a believer. I came to India as a plain traditional Christian. Uh, but I became a believer here through Indians. True Indians, you know? So um, I, I received the faith in Christ here. And now, why the cross is so central? Now the Bible does not refer the cross as something attractive, something uh, pleasant to decoration. It, it, in fact, there is a picture completely opposite in the Bible. The portion of the Bible in the old part of the Bible, that is the books of the Jews, uh, the first half of the Bible, we call it the Old Testament in the uh, English language, it refers to the cross as something not nice. You'll be surprised. Uh, it refers to the cross as something ugly. It says the cross is a place of cursing. The cross is a place where somebody who is to be punished badly and somebody who is cursed, somebody who is rejected by society, the cross fits him. And there is a statement in the uh, books of the Jews, the first half of the Bible, that says, it's God's word uh, said by a prophet. It says, cursed is the man who hangs on a tree. Uh, it was a reference to the uh, tree, a reference to a cross. Um, so, uh, when in the life of Jesus, the cross was not a pleasant thing, desirable, but it was a necessity for something which I'll explain. Um, uh, the Bible, as you are aware of, uh, some of you may not be aware, just quickly, is made out of two sections. It is 66 collection of 66 books uh, written over a period of approximately 4,000 years. It's not one book, it's a collection of books. And uh, the first half, that is the books of the Jews, uh, uh, it is uh, mainly prophetic and written by prophets of various history in the life of the uh, history of the Jews. 
And right from the first book onwards, there is uh, sometime almost directly, but very often indirectly, reference to the cross. Now, the, why there is a, a, where does the cross come? Why, why the cross? I have not yet explained it. I'll try to come to the point. Uh, basically, it's the gospel. It's a gospel, the, the, the news of salvation from sin. There the cross comes. Uh, essentially, uh, the Bible reveals to us that man is a sinner. Man is a sinner by nature. He inherited that from the days of Adam. I was born and brought up and in my nature, I'm a sinner. And therefore, I, I sin. Sin by thoughts, sin by words, sin by behavior, and many, many, many things. It's the nature of man is sinner. And the Bible also says that the person who sins, he reaps death, a sentence of death. Uh, there is a spiritual death, there's natural death, etc. So there is a sentence of death on every human being on this earth because of sin. Because sin is offensive to God and therefore man and God cannot fellowship together, cannot come together because of that enemy sin between them. And now what happened is, this sin is so grievous and so serious and so great that whatever I do to pay for the cost of the sin to get rid of it, it is too small, not good enough to wipe sin from my life. See, if I give charity to the poor, it is very nice, that's a beautiful thing, the Bible recommends to do that, but it is not big enough to wipe sin from my life. As far as it's a good act, it is a good act, but not good enough to wipe sin from my life. Okay, now, God sent Jesus, a perfect man, a man without sin, a man would refer, prefer to suffer rather than sin, an exception, a person who sin did not enter him. He was tempted in every way, but yet he did not sin. Therefore, the sentence of death does not belong to him as it belongs to all of us. He deserved to live forever. That was the quality of Jesus from the spiritual point of view. From the point of view as man, he walked as man on earth, like anybody else. He had to work for his bread and many different things, like anybody else. But from the spiritual point of view, he was not worthy of death, because sin did not succeed going into him. Okay? So in that sense, he was a perfect man. Now this Jesus obeyed God to the point of being wrongly sentenced to the death of a sinner. Okay? So therefore, satisfying the justice of God that death is the price for sin. A perfect man who don't deserve to be dead, who don't deserve to taste for death, and he was willing to die on behalf of others, Paying the price of sin. Therefore, the cost he's paying is worthy to wipe away sins. It, see, the, 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 the sacrifices which everybody does in trying to remove sin from their life is not successful in removing sin. But Jesus, because of his value of being sinless, because of his value of obeying, obeying God till the end, therefore the sacrifice he offered was acceptable to God as a cost for sin. And there, that is why the cross of Jesus is central in the Christian life. And that is why it is necessary for Jesus to die the death that God knew about it beforehand. And that's why he was, um, uh, his death was the key for those who believe in him and those who receive that sacrifice in their heart and accept it, they are entitled that their sin is paid for. You know? It is a, a, a cost for paying for the sin. 
you know that is what the cross is in the Christian life that's why it is central that's why you remove the cross from the Christian life you have removed the whole Christian faith now the dispute here is uh, many people not just Muslims some other people also uh, they they uh, they say Jesus did not die on the cross that was uh, that was uh, I'm, and I'm not uh, of course doctors like you will know better than me in details but my part I say Jesus did die on the cross and I'm going to uh, in the time available as now I just give you a, an idea why the cross is important central in our life because that death was the key for my sins to be removed from my life it's a free gift from God God paid his the price himself God himself paid the price therefore what he pays is good and worthy enough to remove sin not like a sacrifice I would do it is a polluted sacrifice because a sinner offering a sinner offering a sacrifice a polluted sacrifice but Jesus a perfect man offering himself though as if he was a sinner he was willing to receive the punishment of a sinner but he was not a sinner it is a sentence of spiritual death in me he said you don't die it give it to me and I'll take it for you and now I'm going to just go uh, through some of the historic things uh, in the uh, scripture uh, some of them are indirectly talking about the death and the sacrifice of Jesus some of them directly very clearly speaking some of them indirectly so I'll go through some of few few things here and there as time permits me now uh, you know the first five, five books of the Bible are written by the prophet Moses and uh, the first book is Genesis uh, that uh, described the history of God created the earth and the first development of human beings in the old times in Babylon etc now one thing is you I'm sure some of you and uh, most of you in school have learned at least heard about the story of Adam and Eve how Adam and Eve was created and he had fellowship with God there was no barrier between Adam and Eve and God therefore God and Adam and Eve see each other they talk to each other there is fellowship there is oneness between Adam Eve and God the Creator why because there was no sin between them okay that's at uh, that time before sinning now later when uh, the devil who came in the uh, this deceiving form of a servant and he succeeded causing them to sin never mind what he sinned and all that basically it's written in the scripture some fruit they were forbidden to eat and then they ate it uh, that fruit is not important what is important is is that they did obey, disobey God they did disobey God and something God warned them that they are not allowed to do so when they did that then sin came to earth and then Adam and Eve was separated from God from that day onwards the rift between God and man started many people say I wish I could see God I wish if God made them you know why I can't see him why I do see? many people wrongly give wrong uh, bad attributes on God because they see evil around them actually evil is man has made it not God but what happened God is righteous in his judgment and see some of the things that happened in the past very small incident I'm not reading the whole thing just small part uh, when Adam and Eve sinned against God and then uh, uh, God was so angry with, with the serpent, so angry with Eve, so angry with Adam, each one accordingly received some measure of a curse in his life. Hmm? Now the serpent received a curse that the serpent will be, uh, all the days of her life will uh, crawl on the dust. And uh, in the case of Eve, uh, God told her, because you have tempted your husband to eat that which is forbidden, from now on your husband rules over you and uh, you'll be in submission to him you'll be dependent on him and also greatly her uh, birth giving uh, pregnancy uh, there's a great pain increase on her in the case of Adam his main problem was that uh, from now on when he works in the ground the ground doesn't give him fruit easily he'll have to sweat and work very hard till food comes and uh, and then uh, their life was limited because death entered their life from that point onwards they are not meant to live forever they are meant to but one thing is very important is uh, related is uh, uh, is about the cross so the indirect uh, reference to the cross uh, which I will just read a, a point here 
Hmm? Yeah. It says, uh, see, God, after declaring the various curses on Adam and Eve, huh? uh, in, uh, if you'd like to write the reference, are you free? Uh, just, I'll read it, uh, just okay. It's in the beginning of the book uh, of Genesis chapter three, it says, therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden, Eden, that is in reference to Adam, and of course, and his family uh, of Eden, uh, to till the ground from which he was taken. And he drove the man and he placed uh, cherubim and so he drove the, out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of uh, the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way uh, to guard the way to the tree of life. See, uh, if those who wish to refer, it is Genesis chapter 3 verse 23, 24. Uh, see, uh, s simply is, after God declared the various things on them uh, and uh, sentence of death basically on them, uh, God chased them out of the garden of Eden. Eden. That beautiful garden, uh, which we normally refer to it as heaven, uh, but actually uh, uh, some beautiful place where they used to enjoy the place, God drove them out from that garden. And what did he place at the entry point of the garden? He placed an angelic being, it's called, uh, angels have different type of categories, one of them is called the cherubim, the closest to God. So angelic being standing at the gate of the garden and he's got a flaming sword and the sword is going right, left in all directions to make sure nobody enters that garden again. See, what is, what is the way to the garden of Eden? The, the, the way to the garden of Eden is only if you pass through that sword. There is a sword at the Garden of Eden which is watching over the entry to the Garden of Eden. And as a Christian, and as I related to other things of the scripture, there is death price to enter the Garden of Eden. That sword has to fall on somebody. Uh, because God is righteous and his justice demands that that sword had to fall on somebody. You see, Ad Adam could not come inside. There's a sword guarding the Garden of Eden. That sword is the death sentence on the one who dares enter the garden. And uh, we see later Jesus uh, willingly gave his life according to the will of the Father and that sword fell on him. And therefore, the garden, the day, the, today the door to Garden of Eden, the door to Garden of Eden is open. Not only to Christians, to all those who believe. See, I, uh, uh, Jesus said, I am the door. He said, I am the door. You want to know the Father, you want to know the heaven, you want to know the good things of God, I am the door. Jesus allowed that sword to fall on him. So that is indirect reference to the cross. Uh, I'll go a little further now. Uh, Bible is rich of indirect references to the cross. And also there is a lot of direct reference to the cross. We're just talking about cross, nothing else, okay. Now, uh, another example is the famous story of the father of all the faithful, Abraham. Now I'd like to commend something. Very few know that the Christians and the Muslims are brothers. Very few know that. Really brothers, not just, make you, not just to make you feel happy, you know, really brothers. The Christians are the spiritual descendants of Abraham through Isaac. The Muslims are the spiritual descendants of Abraham through Isaac, uh, through, I'm sorry, Ishmael. Ishmael, Ishmael is the brother of, of Isaac, really Muslims, Christians, they come down from Abraham. They have brothers, but they are not natural brothers, they are step brothers. They are brothers from different mothers. So when I say brother to a Muslim, it's not just to make him feel nice. It's really a brother. His spiritual earlier father is Abraham, Prophet Abraham. And my spiritual earlier father is Prophet Abraham, same Abraham. 
okay? Okay, so that's just diversion, no mind. <laughs> Little diversions I do here and there. I'm not a very serious teacher. Uh, some interesting things in between I put. Uh, okay, now we'll look about Abraham. Uh, Abraham had the famous story of being tested concerning his son, Isaac. Now I know some of you are not familiar with the Bible, so I, I add a few basics because I know not all of you have read the Bible, some of you may have not read. So I will just not put too much details, but just to get your feel of it. Now Abraham, God told him to come out of Ur because it's a land of sin. Ur is in Iraq, it's near Basra. Uh, I've been there, it's, now it's deserted, there's nobody lives there, just some monuments there. So, uh, uh, because it's a land of sin, God told him, get out of, it. Get out of Ur. Come, I'll take you to a land uh, much better than this, a place better than this. Now Abraham did not know what sort of a land God took, but he obeyed God and he moved. And God did not keep his promise immediately. It took a long time. And for many years he was married to Sarah, and he, she was barren, she couldn't bear children. And for many years, he, God told him, I, I, I'll give you children, so many. Look at the stars. So many stars are there in the sky, that much he was your children. Look at the sand in the sea, so much sand is there, that much children. But for many years, he never had children. But by faith, he believed God. By faith, he moved, you know? By faith, he moved. And um, after many, many, many years, after many years, then his wife got fed up, you know? And in those days, not today, in those days, it was not immoral for a person to marry several wives and even their servant women can be a wife also. In those days it was morally perfectly all right. Okay? Now at that time his wife told him, uh, why you don't marry uh, our servant so you can have at least children from her. So he did, uh, had a servant from Egypt, her name is Hagar, so he married her and he had Ishmael. But then it was time for Abraham to have a son according to the promise, according to God's word. And his own wife, Sarah, became pregnant and she bore a son, Isaac. Imagine what is the heart of Abraham after so many years having the promised son. You know, imagine you are married and, and, and for say 20, 25 years, no children, God promised you a son, God promised you, suppose you are a very wealthy man, who's going to take all this money? They will cheat me and they'll all take. Then afterwards, after 20, 25 years, and your wife expect a baby and a child is born. Imagine how is your feeling towards that boy? After so many years of waiting for that boy, that what happened to Abraham. That was his heart attachment to Isaac, his son. And then one very nice night, something very interesting happened. Something very interesting happened. Yes, could you help me with the reference? That Isaac, testing with Isaac. 22, chapter? Genesis. Genesis. Uh, Isaac, no. 22. Huh? 22. Yes. Uh, it is in Genesis. Nice, my pastor nearby. He'll help me to pick it up. <laughs> I told you I'm not a very great teacher, but the spirit of the message I'll give, okay? Uh, even though I, uh, okay. Now, in Genesis chapter, uh, uh, that is about Isaac, huh? uh, chapter 22, uh, it says, now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. Okay, it is sounding very simple, but it was a very serious thing and said to him, Abraham, I said, here I am. And he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and after him there, uh, offer, and there offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Very terrible thing happened to him. After so many years waiting, and the boy become a little teenage, you know, quite strong, he could carry luggage with his dad, as mentioned there. So, God says, I want him as a sacrifice, okay? Now, uh, I'll come to the point which I'm saying. I'm not putting all things together, okay? Just a few points. Then Abraham, with all the pain in his heart, faithfully gets up early in the morning and take all the tools necessary to offer the sacrifice, the knife, the fire, etc. And he goes all the way to where God told him to go. Okay, 
And then he left the servant behind and took his son and went to the Mount of Moriah where God has told him. And then something very interesting takes place. Very, very profound statement takes place here. There. I'll, sh I'll take shortcut. So, uh, um, uh, But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Look, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? <laughs> the son said, We got fire around. We got uh, uh, wood. Uh, and me and you alone going up the mountain. Where is that? Uh, usually they offer a goat or a lamb. Where is that lamb? Huh? And now see what happens here. And, and Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. And the two of them went together. It's a very profound statement. Abraham spoke by faith. He said, God will provide for himself an offering. See? He didn't say God will provide a sacrifice. He said, God will provide for himself an offering. Now, if you read the books of the Christians in the New Testament, that is the second half of the Bible, the authors, they expand on this point. And they said, Abraham spoke by faith. When he spoke to Isaac, when he spoke to Isaac, he was thinking that God will raise him back from the dead when he spoke to Isaac. That's how he spoke. Uh, something like this happened, but not exactly arose from the dead. And then they went up, and then they came to the place where God, which God has told them. And Abraham built the altar there, and placed the wood in order, and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Notice that his son didn't run away. He allowed his father to tie him up, although he was a big boy at that time. He could run away. Okay? And then what happened? And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horn. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called that name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. See, uh, summary of that thing is, Summary of that very dra big drama is this, is Abraham went up and then he told, God will provide for himself a lamb. God is demanding a sacrifice. See, I'm putting my own words in between. I'm just paraphrasing. God demanding a sacrifice. There is a, a, a need for a sacrifice. God wants a sacrifice. But where is the, where is the lamb, the sacrifice? God will provide for himself the lamb. That's what happened. And that's what happened. God spared Isaac. God spared Isaac. God was not even thinking of killing Isaac, the Bible somewhere else says. He was just testing Abraham. God not in the business of killing children like that. God, he gave him Isaac as a gift. He wouldn't just take it like that from him. Okay? And, and then God through miraculous act, he stopped him at the last minute through an angel of God in a very critical point in his time, life. And he said, he gave him one, some other thing to be sacrificed, not Isaac. So here we Christians, we look at it this way. God spared me. God spared me. I'm in the place of Isaac. Anybody who believes in Jesus in the place of Isaac. God spared me from the sentence of death of sin. There is a sentence of death on me. And God's justice demands that wages of sin is death. You see? And it is right that I should die and go to hell. Okay? But what happened? God provided a sacrifice for himself. Christ Jesus is the sacrifice uh, on the cross. You look at Jesus. You believe in him. You receive him in your heart. Therefore, God's justice is satisfied. That sacrifice instead of me. That any man dies for me is not good enough. But Christ dies for me is special. 
There are so many people who die for each other. There are sometimes husband die for his wife because he loves his wife. That's a very noble act. That's a beautiful act. Okay? But uh, I'm talking about saving from sin, not saving from small things. Saving from eternal judgment, from hell, from the fire of hell. Any sacrifice will not do. Will not do. The New Testament, the Christian part of the Bible says, God, he's talking to believers of course, Christians, and he said, God delivered us not through the blood, or sacrifice of blood of goats and cows and animals and all that. I'm not hurting you, feeling, just telling you what it says. Uh, but he delivered us through the blood of his own son, Jesus Christ. See, that is so central, so central in the Old New Testament and post New Testament. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, my sins were paid for. In the eyes of God, there is a list of sins that needs to be punished in me. But Jesus said, put it on me. Put it on me. I, 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 that, that list put on Jesus, you see? And therefore, but if somebody else die for my sin, nothing happens. I, I will not be safe from sin. But only particular person, a perfect person, is having that um, uh, that privilege and how to die for others, he wash away their sins. See, right now there are many, many things written in the Old Testament. Many, many things. I'm not going to read all. I'm just going to just refer it to you. Huh? If you'd like to refer it, I'll help you later. Uh, I just to know how much time left is. Uh, exactly 13 minutes left. Yes. Or, or gone. Left. Okay. Oh, there better rush. I better rush. <laughs> Okay, um, uh, the Old Testament, God gave symbolism of the cross. And uh, uh, you know the story of uh, the Jews being saved uh, from Egypt. Very famous story in the history of the uh, Jewish nation. They were slaves in Egypt for several hundred years. And then God visited them and he saved them through miraculous act. And uh, he gave them this symbol. Tonight I'm going to kill all your enemies, the children of the enemies at that time. And to force them to leave you. And he made them slay a perfect lamb. A lamb without blemish, not sick, not blind, not limping. A perfect lamb. And God told them, you put the blood of the lamb on the doors of your house. And in the night the angel of death will come. Any door that don't have that blood, their firstborn will be dead. But this is what happened to the Jews in that time. They, they obeyed and they put the blood at the gate and the whole nation, Jews nation, that night were given permission to leave Egypt. That day I was, uh, yeah. So uh, uh, that was a reference to a perfect lamb, a sacrifice of a perfect lamb, not any lamb. I won't just bring any lamb. For a perfect lamb, there is a salvation from death. That is a symbolism. Really, it was not the lamb. It was a symbol of Christ coming later. Now you go later, uh, one time in the history of the Jews, they rebelled against God. They did it many times, 10 major times they did it in the Sinai. And then the serpents came and just bit them one by one. And many were poisoned through serpents. It is mentioned fiery serpents. And then God told Moses to do something very strange, very strange. He told him to make a serpent made of bronze, brass, and put it on a high stick. And everybody from the Jewish nation looks at that serpent. He'll be healed from the poison of the serpent. Now it is mentioned in the New Testament, comments on that. It says, see this, the snake is a serpent, is a, is a symbol of the devil. Snake is not the devil. Snake is just the symbol of the devil. Snake is just an animal, okay? And now what happened is, Jesus was hung on the cross, became a serpent for us. He who was perfect, more perfect than angels, but he was willing to be like the serpent sin on the cross. You look at him, you receive him in your heart. Tonight your sins are washed away. Tonight your sins are washed away. You don't need some religious ceremony. Tonight your sins are washed away if you receive him. You look at Jesus who was hung on the cross. That is the so central. So central is the cross in the Christian faith. So central. Uh, and throughout the history of the Jewish nation, 
God told them symbolism. He gave them symbolism to remind them of forgiveness of sin. He said, you bring a lamb that is without blemish. There is no spot in him. He's not blind. He's not limping of certain age. Only that I accept as your religious ritual sacrifice. God was reminding them the future Christ. The perfect blameless lamb from the point of view of sin. As man, he was just plain man like you and me. He, all his godly power and authority and qualities, he kept aside. He walked as a plain man, subject to pain and sin. It's, sorry, I'm not, temptation of sin. Temptation of sin. So, this is the central thing. Now, you come to the New Testament. You come to the New Testament. It's very obvious about the cross. The whole New Testament is based on the cross of Jesus. Paul says, the Apostle Paul, one of the famous uh, leaders in the New Testament, he said, I preach Christ crucified. I got nothing less. Many people wanted Paul to preach the Christian faith, Christianity, minus cross. But he refused to do that. He said, I preach Christ crucified. That's the only, it is foolishness in the eyes of people who don't want to believe. The cross is foolishness from the point of view of naturally. Uh, wow, you, your God goes and dies on the cross. It sounds foolish. It is sounding foolish. But actually, it is, it is God's wisdom. Because God's wisdom is different. God had to sac satisfy his justice. Uh, God had to be a blameless person to die for the sins of the world. Today, anybody who believes in Jesus, death on the cross... He was buried after three days. He rose. He defeated death after three days and received his godly authority again. Anybody who received that act, his sins are washed away. Your destination is changed. Going to hell, going to heaven. So that's it. And plus many other benefits. That's just one of the major benefits is then the cross. Now, in the New Testament, it's fully based on the cross. You take out the cross, the whole Bible is not worth two paisa. I'm, when I'm talking Bible, I mean the books of the Jews, I mean the book of the Christians. There's one chapter, Isaiah 53, so clearly about this, so clearly about Jesus suffered and died. So clearly, so clearly. Isaiah chapter 53. Now lastly, uh, I got just a couple of minutes, right? Now lastly, lastly, in the last book of the New Testament, is a prophetic book about things in heaven. One servant of God by the name John the Apostle, there are two Johns there, one is John the Apostle, he saw visions of heaven. And he said things about trouble in the Euphrates, war in Euphrates, that's the Iraq area. He predicted things what's happening today in the Euphrates and you can see it for yourself. Just read the Times of India and you'll see all the trouble in the Euphrates. Many, many things has been said, but one thing very special said, he saw in heaven, the lamb that was slain. You see, Jesus is referred to as the lamb that was slain. Of course, Jesus is not lamb physically. He's not a lamb. He's not a sheep. He's a man. Okay? But symbolically, he was that perfect lamb of God. Where throughout the history of the Jews, throughout the history of the New Testaments, God, Jesus is referred to as a lamb. In heaven, he's known as the lamb that was slain. Uh, so, if you take out the cross from the Christian faith, there is no Christian faith. There's some uh, list of do's and don'ts, that's all. There's no salvation, there's no breaking with sin, there's nothing. The cross is very central. The cross is, um, um, is, is the main thing that God gave. God died on my behalf. See, he was willing to come down from heaven. He was willing to walk as man in the pains that man tastes being tempted in every way you are tempted. If you are tempted, Jesus tasted more than what you, you think. Okay? You believe on him. He breaks that lust and that, that addiction and that bad habit and that curse in your life. Jesus breaks all that from your life. You have to just say yes to him. And tonight you go home and just pray to him. You receive salvation from sin. Uh, I think my time is up. Okay. Happy shirt. <laughs> okay, good. Five minutes, I can do miracles and that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> praise God. Okay, um, uh, one thing is, uh, uh, it's for now only. Okay, it's my label. <laughs>
Okay, five minutes is not bad. Huh? <laughs> no problem. Right. Uh, now, uh, there is one evidence of, one, one category of evidence of the cross of Jesus is the Bible. That is the books of the Jews, the books of the New Testament of the Christians thoroughly surrounded the cross directly and indirectly directly and indirectly you can read it for yourself it's available very reasonably priced there are many barber shops in Bombay and if you don't know we will tell you later okay uh, uh, another level of evidence that Jesus did die and he was sentenced to death is I'll give you it is not from the Bible it's not from the Bible from the enemies of Jesus those who hated Jesus. Unfortunately, the Jews themselves, uh, historically, they rejected the message of Christ. They said, this is not really Christ, this is a false Christ. So finally, they sentenced him to death. Now, if you are aware of, the, the Jewish nation, they maintain current history book. Uh, as major events take place in the Jewish nation, they record it uh, with their religious authorities in a book called the Tilmud. Some of you may have heard of it. If you refer to the version of the Talmud around the time of Jesus, 2,000 years ago, you will read that Jesus was put to death. He, of course, they will say wrong things also. They say he was false Christ. He gave a wrong message. They say he was a magician. They said wrong things. But one thing they said, they say Jesus was put to death because he did wrong things. Uh, but that is another, that is, a, that is not religious. That is outside evidence that Jesus did die. The people who handled him, they did put him to death. That's a, a third, third type of evidence of the cross that is real is the evidence of the Holy Spirit. Today Christians, according to the teachings of the Bible, they pray on the sick. They pray on demons. They pray on troubles of life. God heals. God testifies that these people are teaching you correct things. Not in one incident. I myself was healed from a serious spinal disease. There are doctors here. They know what I'm talking about. Ankylosing spondylitis. Incurable. A disease that puts you in bed. You cannot walk with it. A disease that will waste your life. And, and 16 years ago, the leaders prayed for me. Uh, I was healed gradually within seven days. I was not religious. I was just believing in Jesus. I was not knowing the Bible, but I had not read even the Bible once at that time. They prayed for me. God confirmed these people are teaching correct things. The cross is real. See, God healed me. And I know people. I know people rose people from the dead. You may, you, may, you may argue with me. I got only two, maybe half a minute more. I cannot argue with you. But there are people today, rose people. I myself happened to me. I was walking near uh, Bombay Gymkhana. One little girl, uh, uh, scooter ran off over her. I carried her dead. She was a, a little less than teenage. Now, I am not a doctor. I cannot tell you about her internal organs functioning or not. But as a layman, I saw her dead. She stopped breathing and she's totally finished. And we rushed her to the hospital. I was praying in Jesus' name for her. And by the time we reached the hospital, she revived and she came back to life. And doctors, doctors uh, just took her for observation, St. George Hospital. Okay? Now, that is not a confirmed rising from the dead. Let's just give you an example. But people confirmed people from the dead was rose in the name of Jesus. They're defying death today. Defying death. They are healing the sick in the name of Jesus. God is giving acts of mercy and acts of love in Jesus' name, the crucified Jesus. You have faith in him. God will meet your need, need of your life. God will meet the need. Today I don't have time. I will have prayed for all of you. But there's no time. But some other time, maybe you could come to our meeting at uh, the Mudar Hall classroom on nine o'clock next Sunday. Uh, we could pray for all of you. My pastor will pray for you. Uh, some people in the church will pray for you. We are not great people. We are not great healers as a brother. As a, uh, huh? We are just ordinary people. I'm just a tuition giver person. I go around houses and giving tuitions. I'm not a great fellow. Even my pastor, uh, he is uh, managing his living somehow and his wife is working in some hospital. Like that. We are not some he great healers. We just speak things happen. But in Jesus' name, he lay hands. Most of the times people receive healings. According to the faith, of course. God confirming that the message of the cross is true. There are many different levels of proof of the cross. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Rockney, for your presentation.